First of all, I'd really like to welcome you to this um, one of the artists' talks as part of the Storytellers exhibition. Um, my name is Marg Main, and I have here Hugh Rivens, um, who's done a beautiful um, series of, of work, well, it's all of the piece called Animal Farm, which you'll have seen in, in the exhibition. Um, and um, uh, what we're doing today, so I've got a chat with Hugh, we've got about an hour to do that. Um, I'll make sure there's, I'm, I've got a thousand and one questions to ask him, so I'm hogging the space to begin with. And then um, we'll make sure that there's room for you and the audience to ask questions later. So, um, so if as we're talking and something comes to mind, you know, note it down, put it in your phone, you know, clock it in your head. So make sure that you kind of keep those questions as we go through um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take it from there. Um, just before I, we kick off, could I just ask whether and check whether everyone has um, seen the work? Um, it's the Animal Farm piece. Yes. Can you just, yes. Yeah, yeah. And have you managed to listen to the audio? No. No. Okay. Fine. Well, that's good. That's like, at least it knows where we stand and where what yeah. we can do. So yeah, we can well, have a really good talk about Animal Farm, which is a fascinating um, story behind it, of course. Um, so I, um, it is a real privilege to do this interview with Hugh. Um, I could tell you that um, Hugh has been doing this actually all your life or all your adult life, um, but he's been doing it more after having a career as a creative director uh, in a commercial graphic design work in London. Um, I could also tell you that he's <coughs> exhibited at the Guardian, at the, at the Guardian at the Barbican, <laughs> Uh, and at the National Theatre and in numerous national print exhibitions. Um, a few, yeah. I could also tell you that his work has been on the cover of so many books that you may well find that you in your bookcase at home, you've actually got Hugh Ribbons sitting there without necessarily knowing it. Um, <laughs> but the thing I think that's really, um, that I do want you to know is that um, one of the things that Hugh is, um, this is all born, of what you yourself use called a fascination with line and pattern, almost to the point of it being an obsession. Yeah, somebody right. did um, said, of course, that's the trouble with you. You're obsessed with line. And I said, well, you could be obsessed with worse things, couldn't you, really? But, uh, <laughs> that was that was a comment that was made by a, a, quite an elderly lady who, who was an art collector, but she kind of was summing up my work, you know. And it was it is all very linear. If you look at everything I do, it's very linear. I can't paint properly I can't not a proper painter I have to draw a line and then fill it in if I do a painting and you know, that's the sort of the way I work if I do paintings so it's, it is really leads itself to being perfect for a lino cut you know because that's all very linear you've got to cut the lines negative or positive so uh, yeah obsession with line yeah. yeah well and that will come through absolutely think the, might, whole yeah. of the, the whole of the, yeah. the, the discussion today so, um, the work that you've got in this exhibition is um, a series of prints which are made to illustrate the book Animal Farm. Do, how, did, how did it all come about? Yeah, I was approached by uh, Mr. Fremantle over there, who um, had seen, I'd seen some of my work, I think, from Maryvale Editions that I'd sent, and, and uh, approached me and said he was, how do you feel about doing Animal Farm? And I said... I don't know, really. <laughs> no, I was absolutely jumped at it. And uh, it, it grew from there. And, and we just, he just let it run. He just, uh, I mean, I don't think he ever really, apart from the cover, he never gave me a brief or anything. I would send him a, a visual and he'd send an email back saying, yeah, great. You know, that was his, and that is perfect for an illustrator. Because if you are bothered by an art director, being an art director myself, if you're bothered by an art director, he's on your shoulder all the time when you're working. And you, you think, well, do they like that? Will they like that? Will, will this, this is right. But you, you're much more relaxed, much more relaxed, if somebody's letting you run with it, you know. And I just worked, read the book a lot of times, and I worked with the audio on all the time and worked it up. That was the first one that I did, which was the uh, pigs on their hind legs for style, because um, I had drawn a lot of pigs, because when I was an art director, we had a pig account. <laughs> so, <laughs> A pig feed account, and so I had to draw quite a few pigs commercially, so I, I could draw a pig half decently. So that's what it was based on. And I sent that to James, and he said, "Guess what he said?" He said, "Yeah, great." So <laughs> that was that was how it uh, developed, and, and they all went from there. 
Um, but one of my problems was that when I said to my daughter, I'm going to do Animal Farm, she said, but you, you do quirky, nice stuff, Dad. You don't do aggressive, you know. And I said, well, I'll have a go. <laughs> so I had to get a bit nasty about it, which is where the, the major one uh, came out as being the, uh, the strongest one, which is a bit cartoony. Somebody said it was cartoony, didn't they? But anyway, it's, um, that's the aggressive one. So it was, it was getting a touch of aggression into it. Yeah, oh, they're, they're beautiful. Um, tell us about the cover, because actually the cover is also, of course, the cover of this rather gorgeous catalogue. And if you have not yet purchased it, they're available for um, uh, outside. But um, yes, yeah, so, that, so that is your cover. But this is now, you just got this book today. You just got this yeah. book today, fresh off the press, number one, I think, just off. It's in a lovely Burspex case, which um, is the same original size of the Penguin paperback of George Orwell's novel and um, this this was the cover that um, we did and that was one we had a brief from James where he said I want to he sent me a sample of some dinosaurs you know so that's very handy you know and um, he said I want it to be a line of, a line of cup lots of detail and colour a bit like where's Wally and uh, so, you know, that's what we did. And we, we, that was the only real brief I had, I think. I think any other briefs at all. And that's, that's, where it, that's what happened to it, become a dust cover. And what strikes me about the difference, so this is a, this is a, a landscape and it's got lots of details. I and mean, we were looking earlier on, but you'll, if you go back inside and look, you'll see each of those very red little hens each one is different. You know, one's lying pecking, one's sitting up like this. And so, I mean, the, the, the level of detail is just, and, and uniqueness to the, the lino is, is just fascinating. So that's, that's the kind of, that's the typical ribbons, if you like. Um, <laughs> but these ones are more portraitures almost, aren't they? So do you have a preference or, you know? Well, I think the, the, these are obviously illustrating uh, events in the story. Yeah. And um, again, I was able to choose um, which parts of the book I wanted to, to illustrate, the ones that appealed to me. And um, at the end of it, uh, James said, I, he came back to me and said, can you tell me where, where all the illustrations go? Because, you know, I just chose them, for, and I sent him the little excerpts from the chapter uh, that it was in. And so that, that was the, um, the lead through to uh, illustrate events in the book. You know, like each one of you could say, quote, that's old major speech, that's working and walking on hand legs. That's the windmill, windmill, the storm at the this windmill, is the one I, all sorts I, of stuff. Um, yeah, I love this one. Just like the yeah, this was the meeting in the mar in the barn, which was again the second one I did, I think, where you had all the animals, and where I developed the characters to a certain extent, because you've got Boxer, the old horse, and and the pigs and the dogs, and you kind of developing the characters for the rest of the book. So started off with the pig, and then did the barn. And then we, they all led from there, you know. And uh, who's, who's going to be, we, we, who was going to be next, you know? <laughs> well, certainly not Snowy, who at this point gets, um, I think that's the, that's the Trotsky character, isn't it, that gets, Snowy gets I believe it's Trotsky. I'm not, don't ask me about the detail, and you'll probably read it and understand it more than I do, but I think it was Trotsky that got ch chased off by the dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and obviously yeah. Old Major um, was probably, um, I don't know who Old Major was. Uh, Marx. Marx, that's right, Karl Marx. Um, and then, of course, the, uh, the uh, snowball was, uh, yeah, that was, that was Trotsky. That was Trotsky, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, um, Stalin was the Napoleon. Stalin's Napoleon, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Does yeah. Any, anyone, do people remember Animal Farm? Do you remember? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's amazing. And of course, it's, it's a fable in its own ways, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a parable, or it's a yeah. parable of fable, yeah. you call it. Um, and I think what's interesting, because you said you said in your, in your audio, you said you thought it was maybe rather boring, because people thought it was boring because they did it at school. Do you yeah, think well, I, I, I was working on it at the same time as my um, youngest granddaughter was doing it for GCSE. Ah. So she was keeping me up to speed on it, really, you know. So, well, no, you got that wrong. It's this and this, you know. So, uh, but that was, that was the interesting thing, you yeah, know, that... Yeah. Um, and she, she was obviously bored stiff with it, because she'd got to do it for... So... Um, I, d I don't know where I've sent her uh, a postcard of the uh, I haven't sent her she hasn't seen a book yet i will see her at Christmas and I'll see if I'll pass the test or not <laughs> <laughs> well I think it's interesting I think it's still that story's got a lot to say now about not necessarily 
you know, left to right wing or, or communism or something, but certainly about populism, hasn't it? And about how it's quite modern, um, really, when you look modern, at it. it yeah. uh, nothing's changed much, yeah. really, if you look yeah. at what's happening in, you know, Israel, and it's nothing's changed much. It's all about power mm. and control of people. Yeah. And, uh, and demography, demographic, you know, like the, you know, I don't know, like like a, Trump and Putin, and yeah. you know, demog de demagogues. That's what I wanted to say. Demagogues, mm. you know, really, really um, manipulating people. Yeah, so, he put his finger on it. Really, he did. Yeah, no, definitely. Especially since 1945, it was um, published. Yeah, that's right. It's really, yeah. you know, that's stunning, isn't it, to think that it's mm. still got relevance today from that long ago. Yeah. So tell me, because you've brought your black and white prints um, and as, a, as they're in the exhibition, but this is in colour. How does, how does that work? Tell us a little bit about, cause you, about the, you know, how you move from black and white to colour. How, how do you well, we had, we had in between uh, the lino cuts, which I, I just sent the original lino cut prints to James, James Fremantle, who printed it all letterpress, by the way, uh, with metal type setting. And it's all done in the old traditional way. But he has a digital wizard who was able to do colour separations. Right. So I, I would have these, the black and white and um, the, uh, the digital wizard would add the colour. I'll just show you, say with adding the green and the red there. So it, it would, they're all scanned and then made into line blocks to put on the letterpress machine and print off. So you, you're going through computers, you can't avoid computers nowadays. But it comes back to being printed traditionally again, so it's quite a traditional publication. But with the, um, tell me if I'm getting wrong, will you? <laughs> it's all it's all sort of produced traditionally, but you have to go through the computers to get the images. Yeah, yeah. So could you talk us through? So one of the things, I mean, I, I'm, I'm I certainly I remember doing a bit of line of cutting at, at, at school and probably like you know bleeding my finger the same way. But could you talk us through? Because it is fascinating the actual. I suppose from my perspective, it's about when you're creating the, 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 the lino, when you're cutting the lino, you're seeing the world in negative, aren't you? And then you have to put it on to get the positive image. So could you just show us a few examples of your, yeah, the Yeah, do you want to pass these around? Hmm. If they want to have a look at them. Let's, we could use that one, couldn't we? Of, um... Don't give it to Tina. She, she doesn't know anything about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> I think you ought to take it up, Tina. Can you pass me that one of, of the major and I can hold that up while people are looking? Yeah. yeah, first thing about it, you're obviously working left to right. So whatever you do is revert, in reverse the other way. So if you're doing lettering, you've got to do it reversed. That's the first thing you've got to learn. Ah, yeah. And then you've got negative and positive cutting, which uh, is, when you, when you know what you're doing, it's quite obvious. But a lot of people don't get their head around it straight away, do they? Uh, they really struggle with, can you tell me again what's a negative... And what's a positive cutting? And I said, well, if you cut it, it's a white line. And if you leave it, it's a black line, you know. But it's, it's quite difficult to grasp until you do it a few times. Yeah. yeah, no, it's really. And are there different depths to it? Or it looks like some of it is cut, is cut very you, deep <laughs> and some of it is like more... Uh, it's not, no, ne not necessary to, uh, to, to go deep. As long as you've... you've it'll, it'll be the same, same level. Yeah. But um, sometimes you cut a bit deep by mistake. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. I forgot to bring any lino <laughs> tools. Have you got any lino tools on you, Tina? No. Um, I forgot to bring any tools with me, but um, they're, they're basically little. There's a gouge and there's a V, and they're like little tiny chisel chisels, which um, can get you really quite fine detail. So, so something like this, and I'm appreciating this is this is a more. I'm going to say simple, but it's a more, it's a smaller, more graphic design than some of your very highly detailed ones. So, yeah. um, how long would that take? Is that a fair, <coughs> would it be possible to answer that question? The, do you do it all at once? Do you come back? Yeah. Well, the, the whole thing with um, this sort of thing is, is getting the design in the first place. It's like everything, it's preparation. You've got to get the design right before you're going to translate it onto a piece of lino because once you start cutting, that's it. So, Probably half and half the time. Half the time is designing. Okay. And then you transfer it to the block. And to cut something like that, I don't know, perhaps a day or two, mm. you know, mm. to cut that mm. carefully. Mm. You know, um, it's, it's a long process. To do something. <laughs> something like that would take a month, at least a month. And yeah. you're designing as you go. Yeah. And so, and you do design as you go. Then the things I did evolve. with that one. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> I did with those. I can imagine. Because <laughs> you can't work it all out. You know, you just, what am I going to do then? I've got no idea. I'll go to bed thinking about it tomorrow. <laughs> no, that's, that's um, yeah, that's fascinating. So, um, yeah, and then my other question around this is, because this is all printed on your own restored Colombian press, which yes, is quite right, special, yes. actually. Well, I think it is, yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, I'm quite fond of it, really. <laughs> <laughs> so so t- just tell us a little bit about how it come, what does it look like, where did it come from, what's, you know, how, how Columbian special was, is it? Was, uh, Columbian was invented in about 1820, I think, in America by a chap called Clymer. And uh, it's, it's, very, it's known as the Eagle, Eagle Press, because it's got an eagle on the top, for it's sort of a counterbalance. And then he moved, moved the uh, equipment, or well, I don't know if he came, I think he came as well, to, to England and Scotland, and um, mainly mostly Scotland, and they were made under licence here, um, not in America, but they were always called the Columbian Press because of the eagle. And the English edition, uh, version, is the Albion, which has not got anything on it, just a, just a counterweight. No, no eagle or anything. <laughs> so that's, that's uh, but the, the Columbian Press I got in 1989, having done printmaking at college in here in Canterbury. Um, and I was working as a graphic designer with another chap who I happened to be at college with. And it was the day Edward Borden died. And I said to uh, my friend, I see Edward Borden's died. And he went, yeah, that's terrible, isn't it? You know, and I said, I wonder if he wants his press. And <laughs> I was left, carried on working. And then my mate came back with an exchange in March. Remember exchange in March? And he said, there's two in here. I said, what? He said, there's an Albion and a Colombian. And, and this chap that I was working with lived in Norfolk at the time. And so um, he bought the one, and the other one was in London. He bought the one in London, I bought the one in Norfolk. So we had to take the one from London, from a garage that was using it to print posters for their Sharaban outfit, out trips. We took the, the Albion to Norfolk and then went the Cromer and picked up the Columbian and brought it back to London. So it was a, and that was how I got the Columbian. Mm. And I think it was four thousand pounds in 1989. Ooh. It's more than the car. Yeah. Yeah, probably a small heist, really, wasn't it? Well, I don't know. I don't know. It was it was quite a lot of money, but I yeah. thought I just got to have it. And mm. Something said, you've got to get this. Yeah. So I did. No, that's um, yeah, special. So you mentioned Edward Borden. So he was a, he really is the one the, the person who you quote as your one of your biggest influences. He is certainly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And what is it about? Because he he didn't just do print. He also did drawings. But what is it about his work that? Well, I relate really to it because I like lino cuts and everything. But he was he was a, he wasn't really. I mean, he could do everything, but he was a jobbing graphic designer, which is what I treat myself. I'm a designer who does printmaking. Mm. And that's basically what Edward Borden was, mm, mm, you know, because he just he had to earn a living and bring a family up, as we all did. And um, he did, did what, what, whatever was commissioned and um, he did some pretty good stuff. Mm, mm. And so I relate to it more than I do, say, to a, a painter or mm, to um, mm, a sculptor or anything. Mm, you know? And that one that we looked at, actually, the one of the in the in the stables was because there's a very there's one of his which is the cattle market and there's a sort of there's yeah a sort he, of kind he of, my um, favorite lino yeah. cut it's a lino cut he did which was turned into a, a color lithography print right um is the cattle market yeah yeah and yeah. it's uh yeah. it's priceless now it's about that big in color and, and it has got what somebody says to me happy little cows in it and i've <laughs> i've carried on with the happy little cows <laughs> <laughs> And you just before we before we started, you just mentioned about um, uh, being part of an exhibition at his museum. Yeah, I managed to inveigle my way into an exhibition that's going to be on in the Higgins in Bedford, which is where the old Edward Borden archive is. All his work is in there, and uh, the the ed- exhibition is going to start in uh, February, and it's called Edward and Me, and it's people that have in- been influenced by Edward Borden. They chose a piece of work, and it, and shown that their, their work that's been influenced by it. So I've chosen Animal Farm and the Cattle Market, and, and they, they've gone for it, you know. So and there's some, some really notable people in this show. I've heard of people like David Gentleman, uh, Angie Lewin, you know, they're sort of like <laughs> very, very influential people. Well, well they're, they're lucky to be in a show with you. Oh, uh, that's sure, that's true. Yeah, I'm sure that's why they're in it, really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
So this exhibition is about storytelling, and of course yeah. this is your illustrated a story. But the other thing that you and I talked about was this wonderful um, um, series of four prints that you've made, which is a good age. Um, that's right. And we've got some right. of them to show you now. Do you want to just talk through the kind of the concept of where it came yeah, from? Yeah, the good. Um, I think it was was Anne Bridges who said you ought to go in for this, if you remember, because it was the qualification to enter this. It was for the Devon Guild of Craftsmen. Yeah. Isn't it? Um, you had to be born before, I believe it was 1950. So I thought, yeah, I'm qualified for that. That's all right, <laughs> you know. So I'm in, you know. That you had to do something that reflected your, your age. It was called a good age because it was just to encourage older people to keep going, you know, keep on keeping on, as Alan Bennett said. So I, I put this idea up of um, four um, images of my life which is, I'll give you one of these when you leave. Um, and I've, I realised I spent all my life near water. You know, Faversham Creek, um, Canterbury, River Star, River Thames, and now back to where I live now, which is uh, Conyer Creek. You know. And so I did this four pictures and um, called The Good Age, and it's just all little anecdotes of my life. And as I was working on it, um, things were coming into my into my brain, you know, and you, you've got the whole, the lino cut there and you've done a little bit in the corner and you've got no idea what you're going to do. You know you've got a river there, done the river, that's done. Um, but then you say, well, I, I'll do that. I'll have that elephant there, you know. I'll have, yeah, I could do I remember so-and-so happened. And it all was little stories. Yeah. You know, yeah, it was all yeah, but yeah, stories yeah. coming out yeah. of one's life, you yeah. know. I and mean, that's, we've all got a life and we've all got a story. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the idea that, that you know our lives do go in epochs often, you know, ages of our, of our well, how, however long or short they may be. Yeah. I just wanted to lift this one up that you brought okay. in and maybe we could talk through a few stories. Yeah. This one this way. Oh, here we are. So this one, can you I'll stand up unravel for yourself? This is, this is the first one, isn't it, about your childhood this in Faversham, is, um, growing up in Faversham? This is Faversham. Um, 1943. <laughs> yeah, it's really 1943 <laughs> to 1959. This is. And it's just, I mean, and you, we, we, you, you, Hughes brought cards. You can take a card and, and, and look at the details. So, but I mean, even just looking at this, we could we could sit for hours even more if we'd had a, a, a pint of beer <laughs> well, in front of us. But um, possibly. There's a few that are really. You know, tell us about the elephant. You say people always ask, "Is an elephant?" But the first here. thing they say is, "Why is there an elephant in that street?" And, and I, I used to live in Westgate Road in Faversham. Some of you are from Faversham, which was a bit, bit rough in those days, but um, in all alleyways. And I, you know, was sauntering down the alley. I was about eight, sauntering down the alleyway one day, and there was an elephant coming down the road <laughs> with a man. And I just stopped and beetling back to see my mum up the alleyway. I said, "Mum, there's an elephant in the road," and she said, "Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, of course there is." <laughs> And it was an elephant going, making its way from the train station to the meadow at the end of Westgate Road, where there was going to be a circus. Everything else had come in on lorries, but the elephant had to come on the train, because it was too heavy. Um, and one of my neighbours, you can see here, you can't see it from there, but came out with a loaf of bread and, and just held it. And the elephant just took the whole loaf of bread and ate it in one go. He <laughs> had a whole loaf of bread in one go. That's brilliant. So, so that was the elephant yeah. was for. And there's a lovely little picture of, of the loaf of bread being fed to this. So, you know, you can yeah, see that. Yeah, that was Madge, yeah, Madge yeah, Kemp. Yeah, yeah. Remember um, Madge? Let's see what else I've got here. I've got, oh, this is a good, I, I love this one. It's like this, um, a little, uh, somebody on a, on a kind of butcher's bike being chased by dogs with a scarf flying in the back. Yeah, that was the, when I was a butcher's boy, about 14, um, I used to deliver meat from a butcher's in West Street in Faversham. And uh, the first day I was there, they were loading me up because I had to go out to Graveney. It's quite a long ride with all these different joints of meat for the farmers and their workers. And they were loading me, and there you go, that's for so and so, and that's for so and so. And there's your bones. My bones. You'll find out. So <laughs> the cycling, I went all the way around, did all the, all the stops, did all that. And then the last one was a farm which was nearly out to see Salter. And I opened the gate, and as soon as I hope there's two big dogs come shooting from out the court and I thought ah oh, the bones so I'm chucking these bones and I did it for about three years I think 
and every week you may have to make sure you, I say, have I got my bones? Because <laughs> <laughs> they'd have they'd had me off the bike, I reckon. <laughs> Right. So that was the bones, yeah. Um, what else have we got here? Um, I don't know. Oh, this is this is the cattle market actually. It's another yeah, that's cattle yeah, market. Yeah, we lived the yeah. Westgate Road, overlooked the cattle market, which is now Amor Close, just a bit. Uh, but it was a big, very big cattle market twice a week with all the all the pigs and the animals. And we used to chase in and out the pens when nobody was there and get chased out. That was our um, our fun. That's what we used to do. <laughs> the big thing in Faversham was the shipyard. Ah yes, yeah. Shipyard. Well, it's Mr. Maloney, yes. He lives, he lives where the shipyard was. Um, and one of the things about the shipyard was there was, this is an interesting story, you'll like this one. There's a crane, there was a crane on the creek that was operated by a man called Ponk. And he was blind. <laughs> My grandfather was chief foreman. And this crane was on rails, operated by hand. And it, Ponk, move it up a bit, move it down, move it up. And Pomp would do what he was told. And one day, my, my grandfather was just leaning on the rail, like this. And the crane started moving. And he was like, Pomp, Pomp! And by the time he'd stopped pulling, he'd had his two fingers off. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Wow. That's quite a story, that. Yeah. That <laughs> so my granddad true. was sitting there, always sitting there with. Mm. But I, I managed to miss going to the shipyard by. A passing the 11 plus, getting to grammar school, and then getting to art school. That was the. Uh, otherwise, we had three generations in the shipyard. I was, my granddad said, "It's a fine place to work, boy." <laughs> mm, yeah, part until you lost my fingers. Yeah, you lost yeah, fingers. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So that was, and it, so that that's quite interesting, really, isn't it? That you know, you came from a family that was working in the shipyard, and you ended up at. at art college you know yeah. I mean that wasn't necessarily you know the the most stable you know environment or job that maybe you're your well family I was at grammar wanted. school you see I okay. was first a member of the family to go to grammar school and family used to treat me so you must be posh you're at grammar school and they're all, all working class people um, but um, what was I going to say well it's just about it was unusual then to go to art college oh, if you yes. went to grammar school they might have wanted you to well, I was going to be a policeman to, well, okay I got all the papers. I was going to go. My father was very proud. He was got me down to be a police cadet at Maidstone. You see, and then I, you know, you have those um, medical tests with colour, and um, we had the usual routine one. And I said, "What's that?" I said, "House." No, it's a number two. And we had all these different colour tests. You know, you have all these colour tests. And um, at the end of it, he said, "You're not thinking of going in the air force, are you?" <laughs> no, no, no. Or the police. Well, yeah, I was actually. Well, you won't get in. So I went back to, uh, so I, I can't apply. And my art teacher said, you could always go to art school. I said, well, really? And he said, yeah, you're going to get the art prize. Didn't you know? So, colour blind, <laughs> you go to art school. <laughs> <laughs> Why wouldn't you? I mean, what, it's a natural thing, isn't it, really? Yeah. <laughs> Well, perhaps maybe black and white lino cuts so was Black it? and white, that's why, <laughs> that's why I do black. I stick with black and white where I can, yeah. 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 Perfect. Red and green can be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, and then the other, the other thing that comes out in here, I'm not, it's, oh, well, actually, let's just look at this one. I'll put this down. This one right. over there is then Canterbury. So it goes Faversham, Canterbury. Faversham, Canterbury. Art College, yeah. London. Yeah. And then Cornia. And then Cornia. Where I am now. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just going to move this back. All right. While we're in. I can. All of the little pictures have got a narrative on the back, so you can see what what's on them. So the um, the Canterbury one is that one there, and we obviously we're in yeah. Canterbury, so it seemed a good thing. And um, this is when you're at art college, and the thing that lo what's lovely about this as well is on the back of um, this little folio up. Is, is some key words that, um, so, so if you're looking, it's almost like a little puzzle you can do over Christmas saying, well, where, hop picking, I wonder where I can find the hop picking. So you can, you can check out the keywords. So it's a really lovely thing. Um, and the, one of the words that struck me about Canterbury was, I'm just going to find it, which was um, the art student life, very exciting and very terrifying, dash, girls everywhere. So I'd like to know more of you. I'd yeah. like to know more. There were a lot of girls. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had um, there weren't many people that went to art school in those days. There was I think about thirteen in the year, 
um, the graphic design students anyway, um, and two were boys. The rest were all girls, who all of whom were older than me and all of whom had done A-level art. I was only 16 had done O-level art, so a pretty good start really. You know, I was trying to catch, I was playing catch up all my art school life. And that, that seemed to be what I was always doing, trying to play catch up, especially with life drawing. Remember the life drawing one? <laughs> yes. Second day I went to uh, college and um, I was a bit late. And you get to Canterbury College of Art, walking through the corridors <clears throat> and um, said to one of the students, I don't know where I was, first year, where are the first years? And she said, through that door. So I opened the door to be confronted by the, the 12 girls all sitting around this nude woman all drawing, doing the life drawing. And I, I mean, I'd never, you know, just talk about an introduction to life drawing. <laughs> and they all sort of like, as I walked in and sat down. <laughs> never to be forgotten. This is a very lovely, you see if you can spot the life drawing class on the Canterbury oh, one yeah. when you get it, yeah. Right. But there's all, all sorts in there that, that, um, that you'll, want to, you'll want to look at. Um, so I'm just going to stop there and see whether there are any questions coming from you. We could go. <laughs> um, the landscapes, do you draw on landscapes that you've known? For, I mean, I'm thinking actually of Animal Farm, or are they completely from your head? Landscapes that yes. I've known. The, yeah, I'm thinking of the, backs, the backgrounds. That are yeah, I think things. over the years I've, I've kind of developed a vocabulary right. of, of, um, with lino cutting trees and flowers and plants and that they, they you see that with a lot of people's work they, they tend to have a sort of trademark image for things you can see if you look at a lot of people's work you can identify um you can see it's so you can see it's a tina hagger for instance you know because right. she does stuff a certain way and and uh, we all do it a certain way yeah. and so you then that vocabulary obviously comes from your background mm -hmm. but um i don't do sketchbooks i never i've done sketchbooks since college really yeah. i'm terribly guilty about that but um some people are drawing all the time um, i draw every day but it's usually a design i'm drawing not sketchbooks mm -hmm. but no it's it's, it's just sort of vocabulary of landscape that i lean on right. so you you can draw as a designer you have to draw a lot of stuff from memory mm -hmm. And so that develops a certain technique. Yes. So that's quite good. Yes. Yeah. And do you think if you'd been in, just following that question, if you'd, if you'd been living in Scotland, would it be different? From, I mean, it seems to me, <laughs> uh, no, it seems to me your landscapes are quite Kentish, actually. You, there's a sort of, there's, sometimes it's the, the marshy, the flatness, and sometimes it's that weald, you know, the, the and those I think are the, the two oast that houses quite, give it away. Well, that's really? true, that's true, yeah. <laughs> but literally the shape of the land is, is quite, um, it's got that, those two things about Kent. Yeah, I, I do like hills, and we're not very hilly around here. We've got a hill, the old mm. hill, and we've got a few, you know. And I, I used to struggle up Borton Hill every day to college in my, my old scooter, my, my old scooter. So quite hilly, yeah. Mm. Do you prefer oil based or water based? Printmaking. Yeah. I've tried water based, and I can't get on with it, unfortunately. Um, it, because they're quite big prints most of the time. By the time I've inked up half of it, it's dried. I get to the next bit, and so um, I, I do. You do water? Do you water? No. I think most printmakers stay with oil based. Do you do oil based? Yeah, a bit of both. A bit of both. I, I can't get on with water based. No. Um, I really can't believe that you managed to get all the way through that for a whole month without thinking, oh, whoops, that's not what I meant to do, or oh, I don't really like that bit. So, is there room to alter things a little bit? I mean, do you find ways? Can you find? You can't ways really alter it once you cut it. A bit more out than you work. No, once you cut it, you can't really alter it. No. I mean, I, when we do workshops um, and people make a mistake or slip or something, and I say, well, try and work it as though you meant it. Yes. That's, that's, yeah. Sometimes so you, you do. Yeah. You do overcut or whatever, and so you try and turn it into something as though you meant it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things I also this, I was <coughs> interested in the scale. So obviously that's much larger than this and these. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then Eric Borden used to do really big ones. He was quite famous for doing very large ones, wasn't he? Yeah, he did. He did do very big ones. Yeah. I, mean, I think he used to put it on the floor and, and then another bloke used to walk about all that on it to print it. You know. Oh right. Okay. He, he did, his press was no bigger than <laughs> like mine. Like doing grapes, like shredding grapes, except shredding. Grapes. But I have I have done meter meter square ones, which have been printed with a steamroller in Margate um, 
Wow. We did um, we did a tiger, uh, an elephant, and a cockerel, and uh, they were a meter square, and uh, they're really good fun to do. But they take ages to ink up, but um, but they're really really good fun to do. So sorry, I just tell us, just slow down. You did that with the steam roller. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't. Mean? I didn't know. What, so like exactly, like a man in a steamroller. Steam, a man in a steamroller. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and what, where in door? Just... It was done in Margate as part of the uh, the uh, the old print festival they used to okay. have down there. Wow. In the street. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and you used to get there um, early on, and then you get all the stuff ready, and then suddenly you hear this. You smell it before you saw it coming around the corner. You smell the steam <laughs> coming. Chup, 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 chup. <laughs> and then you come and do the printing, and and. One year we had, we did it about three years, one print uh, steamroller driver who really got into the printing, you know, he would, he got kind of crafty about it, you know, he was sort of like, I'll just, I'll move back another inch, if I come down here, Hugh, I'll just catch that bit down there, you know, but he really was got into printing with a steamroller, which wow. um, was quite imag <laughs> imaginative. <laughs> Absolutely, that's right. But they are nice prints when they, when they work. So, you, and actually you just reminded me, because one of the, th you, you did tigers and... I did a tiger. A tiger, and then you said two other things? An elephant. Again. Yeah. And the third one was? Cockerel. Okay. Yeah. So cockerel was one thing, but the tiger, now you do have quite, I mean, not, not in these ones, but you do have quite a lot of what I call exotic or tropical animals in, in your in your. Um, yeah, vocabulary. I did a lot of animals. I did a lot of animals at one time. Yeah. yeah. I was yeah. into animals, yeah. yeah. And yeah. What, got, what got you into doing that, tigers and palm trees and, you know? They're very beautiful. Well, They're another whole set of. I mean, as it is, like a sort of parallel vocabulary, isn't it? It's lovely. Yeah. Well, the um, the tiger is a classic thing because again, Edward Borden did a fantastic. We've seen it, a fantastic tiger, Lano cut, and I thought, well, I've got to do one of those, you know, um, which I did, but um, nowhere near as good as him, obviously. But it it, it just was a natural thing to do because yeah. so they are very linear. Yeah. Because tigers have got stripes all over them. Yeah, yeah. Did you yeah. know that? Lines, yeah. patterns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> getting them, getting them, okay. So I'm really into you know the lines of the yeah. lines of the tiger. Yeah, yeah. I did a lion once, but it wasn't very good because lions don't have any stripes, so yeah. you know, no good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that's fine. Um, and then the other thing that you do a number of, uh, quite a lot of, is um, is your sporting interests. So we didn't really talk about that, but I started picking up on the fact that football seems to feature a bit. Well, football and, uh, is is featured um, in the. Um, the Faversham one, because I played for a couple of um, teams on the wreck mostly, in, in back in the back in the days, and uh, the team I played for most was I don't know if you've heard of it, probably very very famous, called the White Heathens. It was the <laughs> it was the name of the team that played, um, and I, I was only a boy, but again I was probably the time I was doing the butchers round, and uh, I'd done the butchers round in the morning. And I uh, was having a little bit of a break at lunchtime. And there's a knock on the door. And uh, there's a bloke I knew from the, being in the park where I was kicking the ball around. And he said, are you doing anything this afternoon? I said, well, not really. No. He said, will, will, you, will you come out and play for the White Heathens? And, uh, and I, I was only, say, 15 and, and got kicked to bits by these big men. <laughs> but I stayed with them. So, yeah. And there's quite a lot of, because um, I'm a big cyclist, so I didn't tell you, I told you what I was swimming, but I didn't tell you about my cycling. So I really love, but you've gone lots of very nice cycle, um, I say lots, but a number of very lovely um, images of cyclists cycling. Like yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm not a big cyclist particularly, but I, I just got into cycling, yeah. yeah. The, the cycling, cycling images. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got actually, um, I'm going to do another one next year because I do a calendar every year, and it was the Owl and the Pussycat this year, and I've already got an idea to do a load of cyclists on it next year. So I might do a cycling Canada next year. Mm, mm, mm. Well, <laughs> Always thinking so. ahead, you see. <laughs> Self-motivation is, um, if nobody comes in with a job, then it's up to you to self-motivate. And that's, that's the secret to keep them going. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, well and, and what is that? Because we did touch on that earlier about motivation. And you talked about the Devon Guild then... Um, that they deliberately were targeting people who were kind of later on in their career in order yeah. to keep 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 going, right? You know, that's right. Got, they still were. got a lot to they say, were. a lot yeah. to do. Yeah, there were quite a lot of old um, craftspeople. Some of them even older than me who yeah. were doing yeah. it. Like some chap did a load of tapestries and yeah. all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a question yeah. of just keep on doing it. You haven't yeah. got time to. You haven't got time to get older if you keep doing stuff. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It keeps that sort of. Um, mm. 
the dynamo keeps it going. Does. And they yeah. keep kind of, yeah. 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 My wife is um, 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 uh, a singer, but also a songwriter. And um, she wrote a, um, a song called Beauty of Youth. Oh. And one of the lines in it says, you think I'm ho- old, I'm well rehearsed. <laughs> <laughs> so, which I really like. It's a bit like that. Yeah, that's, that's do not underestimate. I might use that one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're welcome. Just, just, just copy, co- quote her. <laughs> so when you left art school, yeah, do you, um, do you find it stressful to be so young? Yeah. Do you find it easy to find work within arts? To find work as a designer? Would you? You've never had to scratch around with. Uh, I was very lucky to meet somebody who was an art director who lived in Faversham and, and so I give you a trial yeah. in uh, at an agency in Holborn and I went up there and did three weeks I think and at the end of it he said yeah we'll take you on so once you're, once you're in you're away you know, you're just going to get the first start and, and then I went from three advertising agencies, design groups, um, corporate advertising, corporate companies about 12 years I was, and then I went freelance, and uh, all in all, um, it was from 90, yeah, 1963 to about 2006, I think it is on here, 1963 to 2001, I was a designer, only living as a designer, yeah, but I, I didn't, you, do, do you speak with feeling, you couldn't get a job, I can't get a job, or... I'm a mature fine art student in my final year as part-time fine artist. Fine art. And um, my peers are struggling to get work. Yeah, yeah. But most of them. Are I think I think artists. it's far more difficult nowadays. I mean, it's so much more difficult. I mean, Peter had a good career in, but he, he never gets started now. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, I mean he he was he was the same era as me, and we were lucky, weren't we? We were lucky. Because there was a small, London was a, like a village almost, and designers um, kind of knew each other, a lot of them knew each other, and it was um, much more easy, much easier in those days. Yeah, and, and, and why, I'm going to say, but why, why was it easier? Is that because technology's made it, made it, something like design has made design more accessible to a larger number of people? Because, you know, in a way, or, or what, was, what was easier? Well, I think it, it grew in the... Um, the 80s, right, 80s yeah, 90s, yeah, yeah. more and more people became designers yeah. and spread that way, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, of course now, graphic designer is a different different animal. Yes, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very different. Totally different animal. I mean, everything you do now is in computers. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. We were lucky when Peter and I were, because Peter was at Canterbury as well, that we had to do all the traditional skills, you know, which um, they don't seem to need, need in these days. You just need to do Photoshop and InDesign and those things, mm. yeah. Mm. I mean, what advice would you give for um, a student leaving <laughs> university right now? Well, I mean, I don't know much about um, modern modern day design or modern day uh, practices, really. That's the trouble. Um, I think you've just got to keep banging away at it. It's a bit like acting or anything, really. I think I don't. I think there's any any magic. Um, you need a load, load of luck, really, to meet somebody. I think that's that's what you need more than anything. A load of luck. Because the jobs that are advertised, they seem to get a huge amount of applicants and they get snapped mm-hmm. up very quickly. Mm-hmm. My, my granddaughter and has just got a job in an advertising agency and I think she, she's she been applying for on and off over a year for hundreds of jobs. Eventually she got one and it was just, she's just plugging away, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And that's all you have, think I have to do, really. Mm-hmm. It's oversubscribed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Tough gig and tough world. To it is a tough world, but it's uh, probably true of every job, I suppose. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. Question? Um, I just wanted to um, ask if you could say more about uh, subject matter um, with thinking about Lino. Um, you touched on it a little bit when you referred to the rather do a tiger than a lion, but just, you know, what in your mind l- l- lends itself or doesn't lend itself in terms of what you are yeah quite quite often it's things that happen um, I've got one called um, it's called out and it's a cricket match but I, I was I was lucky enough with my son to be in Sydney cricket ground when England you wouldn't believe this we won the ashes <laughs> distant in 2011 I think it was and I, I was enjoying the the last day and we just won the ashes and everyone was applauding and everything and my son shouts in my ear over the crowd and said 
you got to do a Lano cut of this. And, and I did. So that's, that's what the, my, my family always say, you've got to do a Lano cut of that. And this, this is called Out, and it's just a, the whole cricket match, and it's Sydney cricket ground. And um, it, uh, it was inspired just by something happening. And quite often it's things that happen that inspire you, yeah. So you can find a way to find those shapes in there because of... Oh, yeah, you do, you do, because yeah. I suppose it's the um, design background comes in. You know, I mean, you, d you design your way out of things, you know. Yeah. That's what you do. You know, you just keep sketching, sketching away and you design your way out of it because um, you're in charge. So it's not, it's, it's easy really, it's not very difficult. you just got to have a little bit of imagination. Chronically, it's like a chronic thing, isn't it? Recording events. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah sometimes recording events, yeah. 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 Do you transfer drawings to the lino and then cut them? Um, usually I, I'll work it out and transfer it with carbon paper and then draw it again in quite a thick felt tip because I, when I'm <laughs> doing workshops I said draw in a felt tip because you never cut a pencil line but you can cut a felt tip line but that, something like that size um, I roughly knew where the river was and roughly knew where the, you know, the top was and the horizon and everything but I didn't know where I was going to put stuff and so it was really quite, quite worrying sometimes. To I used to go to bed worrying about <laughs> what I was going to put in that space I'd left. You know? <laughs> I think that's probably over, over, overdone with the art school there. There's a lot of art school, but then you see that's Canterbury was four years at art school. Mm, so. yeah, 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 and changed my life. I mean, it just t totally changed my life. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd have been making ships. <laughs> <laughs> on a river still though with a, you know. oh on a river yeah, yeah. with the animal farm thing you said they gave you know your ideas they were yeah etc but you really had things where they wanted something different how do you deal with that what you mean not the animal farm project you mean something else yeah something else but they're yeah, they so if, if James was the perfect client, as I understand he was what was the, what was your most disruptive client <laughs> yeah you did you did get um, and Peter would uh, bear me out with this you'd get halfway through a job and then they change the brief or oh no it's changed and so you had to be pretty quick on your feet which is all good training for doing this sort of thing you know um, it, yeah you, you you don't always get the brief it's, you, it's not always sailing through they change it quite a lot yeah it's been so interesting getting into different bits of your work and, and enjoying so many of them and me thinking, oh, if I'd like to have a Hugh Ribbons, which one would I like to have? <laughs> and then I thought, well, that's a perfect kind of desert island question to ask, which is if there was one work of all your many works that you would, you know, if you were going to Desert Island and said you could take one, which one do you feel like has given you the most satisfaction? Which one's closest to your heart? Which one would you take? Well, the, the, uh, the print that I was most that meant most to me, I think, was probably about 1990, because I was just got this, this Colombian press. Although I'd done lino cutting at an art college, not to any great level, uh, I suppose I did pass an exam in it, um, but I got the press and I was trying to work out how to use it be, and while being a graphic designer. And I wasn't getting very, very, well, very far, really, very, very well. And my wife at the time was making leap, leaps ahead because she was also a printmaker. She is a printmaker. Um, and I, I was just trying to crack it all the time. And then I, I got a piece of driftwood from Sea Salter. And I cut a cockle shape and it had a very heavy grain that had been lifted by the sea. And I printed this uh, grain and cut the cockle out of it. And then I printed some colours underneath it with lino, about three or four colours. And then the last pull was the, 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 the wood grain going on the top in black. And I remember pulling it back, the, the, the wonderful reveal... And you pull it back, you know, and I just, even my jaw dropped because for the first time ever, I'd actually produced a half decent print. You know? And uh, I remember walking down the garden path with it like this. <laughs> and my wife was in the kitchen, she went. <laughs> <laughs> you nailed it. And it, it, it's it. still probably the best print I've done. It's a wood, it's a wood cut. And I printed so many of them, I just flattened the block. I've still got it, but it's virtually like that now. 
So yeah, the, the woodcock. It's called yeah. woodcock, okay. even though it's a cockerel. Okay. It's made of wood. wood. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. You've got yeah, the clue. Yeah. There's a clue there. Yeah. Wood and cock. <laughs> <laughs> I got that one. I got that one. Yeah. So that would be the one. Perfect. Yeah. All right, Hugh. It's been a and real the animal farm book. And the animal farm book. Yeah. It's been a. <laughs> It's been a real delight to talk to you. Well, it's um, been great. To um, Hugh's around afterwards, so and we're not having to rush out of the room. So if you want your catalogue signed or anything signed, he's here to do that. Um, we've got. Um, he's kindly brought around these. Yeah, and if you you'd like to have one of these, these yeah. come and help yourself. They're very lovely. I mean, they're really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Kept me occupied for several hours. And um, um, and then you can also have a closer look at the lino cuts or anything else that he's brought yeah. with him today. So um, thank you very much for coming and thank you to Hugh. It's been a thanks, real pleasure. Thanks for your interest. Yeah. Thank you.